And then the more I traveled and the more you see, your priorities change. Even traveling, you start to see the world so differently. I'd already, as I was traveling, I was constantly thinking, what can I do so I can travel more or be overseas more? Or... Yeah. You, 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 do, you do something about it and you worry about the consequences later, but that's compassion. At the end of the day, how's your conscience? How do you feel about what you did today? Do you feel you've achieved something? Do you feel you've made a difference? Do you feel content? Can you sleep at night? Welcome to The Human Experience. I'm Jennifer Peterkin, and this is episode nine, Teresa's story. Teresa was born and raised in the UK, but has made her home in Kenya with her husband, Ibrahim. Teresa and Ibrahim run a guest house in Katali, Kenya, called Karabuni Lodge. Karabuni, by the way, means welcome in Swahili. When I visited Kenya last summer with Nema, I stayed at Teresa's place. Karabuni Lodge is beautiful, complete with lush surroundings, a welcoming atmosphere, delicious food, and strong coffee. Teresa was so generous in sharing her story, from her journey of coming to and settling in Kenya to the community in which she has grown roots. You can visit the show notes to get more information on Karabuni Lodge, as well as Child Rescue Kenya, the organization Teresa is involved with. I know you're not originally from Kenya, correct? No, I'm not. No, I'm <laughs> British. Okay. I was born in London. Um, when I was 11, my parents moved to the west of Ireland. And so I did my high schooling in the west of Ireland, but I then moved back to London when I left school and did college in London, got a job. I worked in the business law, corporate law sector, did a lot of mergers and acquisitions and all that sort of stuff. Um, And that's where I stayed for many, many years until this little thing at the back of my head that pushed me to travel finally pushed me to really travel not just for (laughs) two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time Um, and I came to a point where I was in between jobs and it's if I don't do this now it will never happen because I'll just come back and I'll be on the career thing and I'll never do it so I didn't look for another job I just got a backpack packed up bought a round-the-world ticket and decided I was going to take off. And then one of my best friends said, at the last minute, I've, I want to do this too, can I come? And I'm like, oh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So two of us travelled for a year together. Oh, cool. Um, across South America, Australia, New Zealand, Asia. And... In Australia, I met up with another friend who I'd actually met traveling in China years before, and she wanted to do Africa. And my other friend was going to stop in Africa because her family lived in South Africa. Mm. So we met up in South Africa, um, and Christine just was going to travel with me for about six weeks. And during that six weeks, I met a Kenyan man at Victoria Falls who I subsequently married. Um, (laughs) And which wasn't a part of the plan at all. Um, (laughs) Never is. And so we spent a considerable amount of time together in Southern Africa, traveling around. And we decided to set up a guest house together in Tanzania because we were thinking, he's a chef. What can we do together um, that works for both, that we both can be interested in, get, you know, enjoy doing together? And we ended up running a guest house together because as I'd traveled, I'd stayed in some real... (laughs) There's no polite way to say it. You don't have to Um, be polite. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. so, you know, budget accommodation that, Uh that, you know, just was just dreadful, awful. Um, So we decided we're going to set up something that's budget to medium that we would stay in ourselves and hopefully enjoy the experience. And that's what we ended up doing. But we started out in Tanzania. Mm. And we spent four years in Tanzania. And we just found Tanzania difficult with red tape because we were both foreigners. Okay. And the visas and the costs and all the rest of it, it just got ridiculous. So we decided Kenya made sense because he's Kenyan. Okay. And we don't have to deal with all of that nonsense. Yeah. Um, So we moved back to Kenya. um, And we had some friends who lived in northern Kenya. 
We were visiting them and they suggested we set up a place in northern Kenya, in Turkana, which is in the desert, about three hours north of here, four hours north of here. And that was our original plan. And we got some land up there and we started to build. And we were going to link our two centers. They're closer to Kitale than us. Um, and then some idiot cut down a forest and diverted a river, which went right through our house one night oh my and flooded us. And we lost our home. We lost our vehicle. Um, we lost everything we owned, photographs, clothes, furniture, everything just went wow. down, literally down the river. And I mean, you're from the States, you know what nature can do yes. when it goes crazy. Um, so we, you know, woke up in the middle of the night, heard frogs outside our bedroom window. Now we're in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Got up to see what frogs were doing outside the window, went up to my knees in water. Oh my and gosh. it just rose and rose and rose. And we got out. And we got out in one piece. And we could be thankful for that. Yeah. So that's how we ended up in Kitale. This was the closest hospital, the closest town. Okay. And my husband got very sick. You know, there was a, with whatever was in the river, water, you oh know, because we, we kept going back trying to salvage stuff for a few days. Um, and he got very, very sick. So he had to go be put, sent to hospital here. Oh, wow. And so I rented a small house here for a month. So okay. we fell into this by accident. Yeah. Um, because this was never our plan you right know, we had this vision of being somewhere more remote mm. um and we ended up in a small town yeah and it just became an easy thing to think well while we're figuring out what we're going to do next we can rent out the spare room sure well, then we'll fix up the you know and look for a place and that's how we ended up here yeah and then gradually we met people who were looking for somewhere to stay we advertised and it just took off and we've been here for nearly 15 years now wow that's amazing. and then in in all of that 15 years we've ended up getting involved in the community getting involved in a lot of um, non-profits and charities um i since my first year here i've worked um, as a volunteer with a street children's charity mm. and I've been the chair lady of that for 15 years and we deal with children on the streets youth needing employment mm. um, training we've helped out tried to help out other charities along the way that have needed some assistance with legal work or administration work um, or networked with other charities. So I've also got a medical charity running on the side for children that need surgeries. Um, and through all of that, we ended up with some of the children that needed surgeries and needed medical help. They would might, might end up staying here in between hospital visits. Mm, yeah. And somehow or other, we ended up fostering or adopting like 15 or 16 of them. <laughs> um, and we've also got, in, you know, fost fostered a lot who've gone home that were still involved with their education or yeah. whatever. So, so, yeah, I'm like the old lady who lives in a shoe. I've got many children. <laughs> so I'm stuck here now because I'm so involved, involved in yeah. so much. And I've got children in school and, you know, so... But yeah. it's beautiful, the life you've built. It's yeah, um, it's it's fulfilling. Yeah, that's it's, great. It's been very fulfilling. Yeah. yeah. So you were in legal work, you said, yes. correct? So yeah. I feel like that's such a pipe dream for so many corporate people who are like, I wish I could just like give it all up and go move to South America or Africa yes. or something. Yeah. And you actually did it. I did it. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I was terrified doing it. But, yeah. you know, and I always thought I'd go back. I mean, it was like I'm taking a year out. And I will come back and yeah. get back into it again. But no, that didn't happen. And the more I traveled and the more you see, your priorities change. Even traveling, mm. you start to see the world so differently sure. from having a nine-to-five existence. You just see how people are suffering. You see reality. You see what's important. Yeah. And you think, I can't go, ever go back to doing yeah. that mm -hmm. ever again. Not the way I was doing it. So Right. But, but it's been useful. And, you know, I like to think that the skills I've had in a career have been put to use for charities here and yeah. people that come to me for some advice. And so I still use it. Sure. It um, certainly sounds like it. Yeah. It doesn't earn me anything, but, but <laughs> it's, it's been useful. It's certainly, you know, been useful. It's been useful for the charity we run with and other charities that, that have come to us at some point where they've had a crisis and we've managed to get them through court cases or... Yeah. just straighten out their corporate governance or 
write a manual for them or whatever it might be. So it's been useful. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you set up formal charities or for each of these different things, like the medical and the business? Or It depends what it is. The street children's charity is a formal charity. Mm. A lot of the charities that we work with, if they weren't already formal, we've, we've tried to formalize them. Um, the medical charity isn't formal because it's basically, I've just done that myself with a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've never formalized it. Um, we thought about it and then we're like, it wouldn't be the same charity if we were to formalize it because it is basically the two of us running it because I do the fundraising or I put my hand in my pocket. Right. And my friend does all the taking the children up and down to the hospitals. She's a retired school teacher. And that's what she, that's how she fulfills her life. You know, she's a widow. She, her children have grown up. That's yeah. what she does. And is she Kenyan? She's Kenyan. Wow. She's absolutely incredible. Then we'll find cases we can't handle on our own. We'll try and find a partner to try and take on a child that needs to go into care after their surgery or medical intervention. Or It's really cool to hear about all of the different parts of community you've surrounded yourself with. And you really just planted yourself and allowed those roots to just kind of reach yeah. out and, and help all mm. those around you. So that's lovely. And hopefully, you know, the guest house does that because I, I would think more than 90% of our customers are here doing a, a project of some kind, <gasps> working with a non-profit, visiting a non-profit. So that's in, interesting because they, they can all network through here as well. They'll meet other people and get sure. to talk to somebody and it'll be, oh, what do you do? Well, we drill, we drill boreholes. We need a borehole. Let's talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so it's, it's nice to see that happen, that people can network by staying through, through here. Or can, when they've left, contact me and say, look, we need... So do, you know such a, yeah. Yeah, do you know someone that can do that? So it makes us different to a hotel. I couldn't run a hotel. That's yeah. too impersonal and... I like doing this because, you, you know, you, you make friends. You get to know people. You have people who come back. You know, you make friends. You make really good friends. Yeah. And you stay in touch with them for years. Sure. You know, we had someone staying last week who was our first guest when we started this 15 years wow. ago. And he and his wife stayed last week. That's so And special. so it's, it is. It's in, you know, and you see their children. You see their grandchildren. You know, so... It, it's not just a job. It's far more than just a job. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, and that really does shine through. And it's a completely different experience than you would get at a hotel or even just, you know, the short-term rentals that are really popular right now, like the mm, Airbnbs, Airbnbs and yeah. stuff. It, it really is like coming into your home and being welcomed into your home. It's It's been lovely, actually. I've Good. never I've never <laughs> experienced anything like this, so um, I've really enjoyed it. So you said you met your husband while you were in South Africa? Zimbabwe. In, Z- in Zimbabwe. Mm. Did you guys hit it off right away? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, as friends right away. Sure. So, yeah, it, it, you know, we traveled around together. We stayed in touch. We visited each other. Yeah, and it took off from there. You know, it's a big difference. It's like you're going to go back to the UK and pack up, basically, and... yeah go to a country because we would agree to meet up in Tanzania Mm -hmm. and investigate living in Tanzania I've never set foot in Tanzania in my life (laughs) so yes it was a big yeah so why Tanzania then well we just thought that you know it was a opening up to tourism it was developing maybe there's a slot there for us sure so yeah and we did we love Tanzania I Mm -hmm. don't regret being in Tanzania it just became more difficult they were looking for people to invest huge amounts of money in high-end tourism Mm. at that time and we weren't those people we were looking at doing this sort of thing you know budget to mid-range so sure we didn't have enough money (laughs) for them I think I think it all worked out for the best no it worked out for the best no well, regrets. And how do you like the the area you're in now? Because you said it wasn't your first choice. Well, Kitale wasn't our first choice. You know, we 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 loved remote. We like peace and quiet. Mm-hmm. Um, we liked the idea of being somewhere more remote. I love the desert scenery in Turkana. I just really love. You know, it was really beautiful up there. Um, so yeah, this was almost too comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but, yeah, we've grown to love it now. You know, it's, it's a small town. It's growing. Yeah. Um, 
But yes, it has its advantages. We have a, we have supermarkets. There was no supermarket when we first came here. Okay. Um, you know, there's decent clinics, decent hospitals, decent schools for the kids. Yeah. Um, we have electricity and water. Mm. Uh, <laughs> all those things, which, sure. you know, living in the middle of nowhere, you you don't have. So we've done both. Mm -hmm. And I suppose as I'm getting older, I quite like the comfort. <laughs> so, so I don't know that, you know, I love going up there. I love the children love going up there. We go mm. up there and camp and we've got friends who live up there and we go up there a couple of times a year um, for a holiday. But I don't know that I'd want to live up there again now. Yeah. So, so maybe God did me a favour. I don't <laughs> There would, might have been an easier way to have done it, but... but um, <laughs> yeah, than a yes. flood, I think so. Than a flood, <laughs> bit extreme. But, that is, yeah, but that yeah. is biblical, I think I, I took think, the hint. So. Yes. <laughs> I took the hint. I mean, that's that's such an incredible journey. I'm just still... You you seem to have gone from one end of the spectrum to the other. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. and, but by, by choice, it wasn't like something had happened and you were running away it was just like you really felt the need to to yeah. just explore yeah did you have family where uh, my family is still uh, you know still in in the UK and and the west of Ireland um and that's been the that's been the most difficult thing that I'm far from family mm. and I don't know if I mean if Facebook and the internet and things hadn't come along I don't know you know whether I would have survived being so far away from family and not being able to just get on a plane whenever you feel like it because sure. it costs so much and it's tough being away from family but at the same time you know even my life in London I didn't see my family all the time mm. you're working you're caught up in sure everything they're working they're caught up with their kids and their other things and so you don't see each other constantly anyway so we got we've you know I've got used to it and we have the internet yeah, and we can Zoom, we can talk to each other, we can send silly messages backwards and forwards on Facebook. We, you know, so sure. I'm probably more in touch now than I was when I first moved, certainly. Yeah, it's come it, a long it's, way. It, it's easier. It's, yeah, it, it, you know, staying in contact is much easier. Knowing what people are doing um, is much easier. The phone system is better. It mm. used to be you'd make a phone call and you'd wait 10 minutes for to hear the person on the other end. Oh, and, my. You know, and, well, <laughs> that's extreme. No, but, I understand. But the time, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then you couldn't hear them half the time. And so, it, yeah, that that's made it much, much easier. Yeah. Was your family surprised when you said, all right? No, because <laughs> because um, I, don't, I don't think my mother expected me to stay away for so long. Okay. I think she thought, oh, she's got to do this and she'll do it and she'll be back. Mm -hmm. They weren't surprised when I upped and did it because they, that, you know, once I'd gone travelling, I think they knew that. You yeah, know, that's it. She's gonna. She's gone. She's gone. Yeah, yeah. And already, as I was travelling before I met my husband and before I decided to do this, I'd already, as I was travelling, I was constantly thinking, "What can I do mm -hmm. so I can travel more or be overseas more?" And I'd looked at teaching English in Asia, and you know, all sorts of possibilities. I can go back out there and do some voluntary work, or I can. I, it was already playing yeah. in my mind. Yeah. I'm not going to go back <laughs> to what I was doing before. Yeah, I yeah. don't want that life anymore. I don't want that anymore. And, you know, I say it to my kids because they're all, you know, I've got one who's leaving school this year and he's agonizing over whether he should go to college or whether he should take a year out. And I'm like, don't agonize over it. Just do the one that feels right. Yeah. Because it's never too late to change your mind again. I love you that. can take a year out. You yeah. don't have to go to college immediately or go to college right and if you don't like it in three months six months just say so and, right you know because I think we've all we've all come through this you must do things this way you must mm -hmm. do that you must do that you must do that and then you're expected to do that and we do it because we feel we have to yeah um and we don't no not at all I love that so much we don't especially at that age too no. you know it's like you don't you don't know anything about yourself yeah how, yeah. how are you going to make life right. decisions th yeah. that seem so permanent? Mm. But I, I agree. Nothing, there, there is very little in life that's permanent. permanent. Yeah. And, you know, I think COVID's taught people that. Yeah. An awful lot of people are dropping out of, you know, big, long, big careers. Yeah. Having been at home for a year, realizing I don't want to go back and do that anymore. And yeah. it's like, well, good for you. If you can find something that makes you happy, do it. 
Because it's it's not all about the money. It really is not all about the money no, and the not comfort. At all. It really is about at the end of the day, how's your conscience? How do you feel about what you did today? Mm, do you yeah. feel you've achieved something? Do you feel you've made a difference? Do you feel content? Yeah. Can you sleep at night? <laughs> and that's it. Absolutely. Well, speaking of COVID, how how did you guys weather COVID? <laughs> oh, that was I hate to say it. I actually we actually quite enjoyed it. But um, at the same time, I worried incessantly throughout it. Sure. I had the children home and my college kids home for the whole six months or so that Kenya was in full lockdown. Mm-hmm. Pretty much the whole town was shut down or most of it, except non- all the non-essential businesses were closed down. Um, and we were just here and we homeschooled. And so I homeschooled all of them for half half a day, five days a week. And the other half a day, they were free to do whatever activities they wanted to do. Um, and we had the most amazing quality family time I think mm. I've ever had with my kids because I wasn't working. My husband wasn't working. We had time with them. Sure. We had just quality family time. So even though we were doing homeschool, it was fun. Yeah. Um, and I had my older college kids here. And they were helping me homeschool some of them as well and doing, doing the subjects that I'm useless at, like Swahili grammar. Um, <laughs> so we enjoyed it. And there were enough of them to keep each other amused. We have, we're lucky. We have a beautiful garden, beautiful space. Yeah. So it was, in that sense, it was really nice to have the whole family together, to not have interruptions, to not have to go somewhere, to not have to work, yeah. um, not have a rigid timetable, and, and that was great. But throughout it all, I'm thinking we're earning absolutely zero income because mm-hmm. we live in a country where there's no social welfare, there's no assistance, um, the government gave no help to businesses that had to close down, mm-hmm. except tax breaks. It's like, a tax break is no use unless you're actually earning some money. <laughs> right. At the back of my mind was this worry about how long is this going to go on for? We can weather three months or six months. We're growing all our own vegetables. We're not going to starve. And there are people far worse off than us. But when is the you know the business going to start coming back again? And I think all of us at the beginning of COVID thought three months, six months, it's all going to be over. Right. And, and it wasn't. And there was that space to enjoy it. Because yeah. you were like, well, there's an end, end yeah. in sight. All these clever people will come up with an answer <laughs> to this. And it, then you realize, actually, they're not coming up with an answer. No, not at and all. And even if they do, people aren't. And even now, people are only starting to travel mm. two yeah. years later. Yeah. And there's still restrictions and there's still problems. So, you know, we, you know, it's, uh, suddenly you realize after six months, yes, the small businesses are opening again and the schools are opening again, but we're not going to have any business really Yeah. for at least another six months to a year or more. So it's been tough. Yeah. It's been really, really tough. Um, this June, May, June is the first time people have started to really okay. start coming back again. Yeah. So, so yeah, really good two, two years, years later. Good two years. Does, Ken- Does Kenya rely on tourism? Yeah, it's the agriculture and tourism are the two biggest earners for Kenya. Wow, I wouldn't um, have guessed that. Yeah, agriculture's number one, tourism is number two. I took the children to the coast in April. We, we found a really cheap Airbnb and we went to the coast in April and we pretty much had it to ourselves. Mm. And usually the coast of Kenya is, you know, full of foreign tourists it's one of the most beautiful beaches in the world it's hotel after hotel after hotel whole families work in the hotels they're all out of half of them are out of work half the hotels are still shut down yeah for certain you know certain areas of the country that rely totally on tourism it must be absolute hell for those people yeah you know the waiter is married to the cook and the cook their son is working you know at the front desk and sure all three are out of work Right. So, yeah, it's a very big sector. Yeah, I mean, and we know that across the globe, but especially, as you were saying, in a country where there's no social net to catch you. There's no safety net. Yeah, Yeah. that makes for an especially difficult Mm. situation. Yeah, it was tough for us, but, you know, it it was tough for people who work in the local market and couldn't take their produce to the market for three or four months. Yeah. Um. It's tough for people who have a little hairdressers 
in town Mm -hmm. and they were shut down because they're non-essential so they couldn't work for six months Um, and they're living a real day-to-day existence some of them and so you know people really struggled with it and some are still struggling if they're in sectors that haven't recovered they're still struggling with it right and now that we finally seem to be seeing the light at the end of tunnel of covid we now have massive inflation here Mm. you know maize prices doubled Fuel prices have gone up by 20, 30%. Everything is just going crazy right now, the prices. So even though people have sort of managed to get back to work, they're now having to deal with all of that. Right. So So, you can't even afford to live at that point. So fun. There's always something, isn't there? Yeah, Yeah, always something for sure. something. So is Kenya your favorite place in Africa that you've been? Um. I don't know. I've, you, it's really hard to pick a favorite because everywhere is so different. Yeah. And Africa is so diverse. It is so big. Um, that's kind of a hard, that's yeah. an unfair question. It's, it's, you know, I loved when I first started traveling around, I spent a lot of time in Egypt, Morocco, Northern Africa, and I loved Morocco. Mm. Um, I've been to West Africa and that's beautiful. South Africa... It's also beautiful countries like Namibia, Botswana. The scenery is stunning. Mm. So, but Ke- Kenya, I guess, is the one I've lived in the longest. So it's it's my favorite in that sense because I'm totally at home here now. Yeah. It's just home. And again, it's a very diverse country. So you can go three hours any direction and and see something totally different. Right. Totally new. So, mountains, desert. Yeah, mountains, desert. Ocean. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Everything. So it, it is beautiful. It helps that most people speak English, that it's got, its infrastructure's not perfect, but it's there. Mm. It's fairly safe to travel around. So yeah, it's it's got, it's got pretty much everything you need. Good. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is my first time in Kenya and the vibrancy of everything is mm. just so stunning. And you turn, I, I told my mom, I feel like I keep taking the same picture over and over again because I'm just like, but I need that red dirt road and that tree yes. in a picture because it's just so lush and gorgeous. And I don't, I didn't think it was desert uh, where I was coming, but I didn't know what to expect. The only other place in Africa I've been thus far is Egypt. So mm. that's very different. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The nice thing about Kenya is it is so diverse. You know, you can go to somewhere like Lamu on the coast and it's very Islamic and very different. Um, and then come here and it's all green and farmland. Go two hours north, you're right in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Go to the coast, it's just stunning beaches. Um, we've got five star hotels. You've got slums. You've got total extremes. So, yeah. yeah. You sound very comfortable even when you were traveling just on your own, backpacking around. But what kind of, especially when you settled into life, everyday life, um, what were your biggest like culture shocks or even marrying somebody from a different culture? You know, just not in a bad way, obviously, but just, oh, this is not what I'm used to. I don't know. I mean, thinking about it now, I suppose, culture shock of marrying someone from a different culture? Not really. I mean, I've always had some a pretty diverse range of friends from mm. all sorts of backgrounds. So so that wasn't such a, a, a big thing. I think dealing with uh, being perceived because I've got white skin that I'm rich. Okay. I, fi- I still find that very hard to deal with. And even when you're in a community where people know you, they know what you do, they've got some concept of what you probably earn or and, and still being perceived as you must be rich. Yeah. I find that hard to deal with culturally that people think that because I'm white, they have the right to walk up to me and ask me for stuff all the time. <laughs> that, that I still find frustrating. Mm. I I suppose... Seeing the level of poverty yeah. here and the fact that no one is really doing anything about it, mm-hmm. you know, the well, government wise, um, right. that I don't see a, an awful lot is being done about it. Seeing that there's still children on the streets of our local town and the numbers are increasing, not decreasing. And the only people who are really doing anything about it are charities, not 
government organizations, seeing the amount of children needing more food, um, families needing more assistance, and, and that not being here. And that that's hard to to deal with that, that, that after all this time, there's still no real social construct here. All right, you don't might not want it to go to the extreme of everyone just lives on handouts, but, but there's there could be more done by now. Right. Um, and that there's just not enough being done. So I still find that, that hard to, to deal with that. But that's about it. I mean, yeah. I've, I've got used to everything else. You know, there's, there's things you think, well, that's a weird thing to believe or that's a weird, but we do it in the West as well. Oh, so gosh, like, yes. And, so. I, I, you know, if your husband was here, I'd ask him the same yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, silly beliefs or exactly. whatever, and I'm like, well, that's everywhere. It's just different. So. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. every place yeah. has a culture and a, yeah. a way of life, and you know, and it's it's so beautiful to be able to integrate with each other and to and to just be contributing mm. to to each other's lives and, yeah. and within each other's cultures. Um, but yeah, we all have it. <laughs> well, I guess corruption here as well is a bit of an art, you know the. The fact that corruption here is from like the grassroots level mm. all the way up, whereas in the West we we have just as much corruption, but it kind of isn't all the way from the bottom to the top. It kind yeah. of it's just at the it's top. It's pretty much at the top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty much at the top. It doesn't go all the way down, and so people here accept it and expect mm. it, and that and that's quite sad that yeah. even it, that that can still happen, and it's accepted. Yeah, it's and just expect it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's that's still hard to deal with. Yeah, I mean, uh, you were telling us the other night about the school fees mm-hmm. here in Kenya and just how the school is, the education is somewhat subsidized by the government, but not totally. And then there's so many other things that are required, mm-hmm. and so you have this thing that's supposed to be easily accessible for everybody. Theoretically, it is, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of it. It's actually not. It's something that people still struggle just to afford an education when that's that should be a right for everybody. Yes. Which is why you have done so much trying to help provide those school fees for for people that just can't do it, that can't make the ends meet and can't make it work. Mm. Yes, it's it's you know, it's one of those things where it's like well, what I thought education was free in Kenya and it's like the government will say, Well, it is free. Because the tuition is free, mm. but all the rest of it's not free. The uniform's not free. The shoes are not free. The transport is not free. The school lunch is not free. The books are not free. The exam fees are not free. The tr- you know, it, it, and it's... The desk. That, the desk. That you have to buy your desk. my mind. Yes. You have to buy your desk. Yeah, you have to yeah. buy your desk. Or pay for a desk. So, yeah, there's so much... Right. So on the surface, on it the looks surface, so yes, simple. The, you, everybody's entitled to primary and and secondary level education. Right. Um, but it's a struggle for a lot of people. And so the schools that will accept less, the ones that will accept you not having a school sweater or that you can come to school in the wrong shoes and turn a blind eye, they tend to, you know, not have the same academic standards as as sadly as the ones that expect you to come to school in pristine uniform and all the rest of it. So, you know, so the education suffers to some degree. Yeah. Um, They're supposed to teach in English, um, but most of these children have never spoken a word of English until they get to school, Mm. in the more rural schools. They're brought up in... Swahili or their local tribal language. They haven't learned any English. So they're going into school at five or six years of age and suddenly being taught everything has to be in English. Right. So they haven't had the advantage of an urban child who's been surrounded by English language or TV or whatever, you know, that they can suck up some language. Yeah. And some of the rural schools, the teacher will just give up and say, well, it's just easier to teach them in their own language because... They're not going to go anywhere anyway, and they don't understand what I'm saying. And yeah, so they're at a dis. You know, that some of those children are at a disadvantage because they don't have the language skill of somebody in Kitale or Nairobi or one of the bigger towns. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, education's got a way to go. Yeah, I mean, you're so in tune to what's going on in your community, which I think is fantastic. How did you start to get involved when you when you came here? Well. 
when we were in, we did the same in Tanzania. When we, you know, we, once we started our business, it was like, okay, we see there's need all around us. Mm -hmm. um, let's look for some way we can get involved and we can help a little bit. In Tanzania, we helped set up some little, um, some guys, we trained them, got them trained as tour guides and set them up with a little, like, tourism office. Oh, that, cool. So they could do tours. Um, take people on hikes. We lived in a mountainous area there, so they could do hikes and camping and, and stuff. But here it was, we don't know, we want to do something. We see children on the streets, what's mm -hmm. going, you know. So we, we looked at children's homes, children's charities, um, visited a lot of them. And then we found this one that I'm still working with, mm. um, which we really liked because they weren't just plucking children and putting them into a children's home. They were investigating each child's family, background, why are you on the street, what, what's the problem at home, and they would go home and investigate the home and reintegrate the child wherever possible. So a lot of the children might be on the street because there was no food at home mm. or they weren't in school because the parents couldn't afford the uniform or they'd had an argument with their father or mother or, you know, something simple. That's right. um, or mother was sick. So they were looking for food. Um, so we liked that because they were going into the family and trying to fix the family mm -hmm. and help the family keep their child at home, which is where the child really wanted to be. So we started to try and help them as much as we could. We had, don you know, uh, donation boxes and donation baskets or we'd buy some food from time to time or find out what they needed or that's how we started to get involved with that. It was we want to do something where we feel we're helping the community. And I've never been a strong proponent of children's homes because I think that's just putting a band-aid on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really preventing a problem. You're taking a child who has a family and putting them into a children's home. And in the short term, it's helping the child and feeding the child. But at the end of the day, that family is still there and they still have the same problems. Sure. And all that's happened now is that that mother and that father have lost their child mm -hmm. and that child has lost their parents. Yeah. And yes, they're being fed and going to school and being cared for, but there's still the emotional trauma. Yeah, is, absolutely. Is there. And I'm not saying that children's homes are bad because that there is more need here than is good, but there is a need. Mm -hmm. But... A lot of those children do not need to be in a children's home. And the reasoning has often been because they're poor or they're coming from a bad, a poor background and people look at the background and think, oh, we must get them out of that terrible slum mm. or they're living in a mud hut. We must get them out of there and put them in a nice, comfortable home. And it's like that's their parents and their siblings right. that they're leaving behind. What about them? Mm -hmm. They need help too. And just plucking that child is not is not going to be the solution. If the child is in danger, right. do, yes. Yeah. But but look at can we help that family? Yeah. Can we help this can that child stay there if we help that family? And not enough of that was being done. For many years, a lot of it was this child is hungry, this child is sick, this child's not being well cared for at home. Take them and put them in a home. And Short term, yes, but longer term, that's not solving anything. No. We need to get into the communities and fix the communities and fix the families. Right. It's and a the child stays at home. Holistic healing. Yes. And and that's what's needed for community. Yes. Otherwise, all that happens is you've helped one child, but you've left behind four brothers and sisters who are now going to have children who are going to need the same thing that that child needed. Right. The cycle continues. Yeah, the cycle will continue. Yeah. So we, we've gradually over time, even my, our organization at the beginning, we did have a children's home. We've shut it down. Yeah. We, we're we like, we don't need to take any of these children into a home. We mm -hmm. might find the odd one or two children on our travels who cannot stay at home, cannot go to their aunt or uncle, cannot go to a foster home, cannot go to another relation, and they might need to go in a home. Mm -hmm. But it's very few percentage-wise. Right. So... We concentrate on reintegration That's as wonderful. much as possible and help the family. Is there a youth in the family we can train to do something? Mm -hmm. Let's go and train them. Is there a parent in the family we can train to do something or give a business grant or help them farm better? Mm -hmm. Let's teach them organic farming. 
let's teach them a skill. Let's take you to be a hairdresser and you can support your family and that child can stay at home. We'll put the child through school. We'll help them with the uniform. We'll help with school fees. The child stays at home. Yeah. And the whole family is better off at the end of Absolutely. the Absolutely. And that's what NEMA, who you're visiting, that's mm-hmm. what they're doing, which is how we got involved with NEMA. It's like, okay, NEMA need a little bit of help right now. We'll help NEMA. <laughs> NEMA are doing the same sort of approach as us. Yeah. You're look, taking a youth, you're looking at their holistic well-being, not just training them to be a hairdresser or a dressmaker or whatever. It's not as simple as that. You're giving them life skills training, morals training, spiritual training, counseling, guidance, visiting the family. Yeah. The whole holistic thing makes sure that the family become accepting of this child, the child is accepting of a family, Mm -hmm. that they can help heal each other. And it works. It does. And it's so beautiful when people are willing to put in the time and the effort that it takes. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, it is easier to just pluck a child out and, or, or anybody out and say, you know, here, here is the model, here's what we're doing. And it almost becomes like a factory setting, you know, you just kind of run through the same thing over and over again. And, you know, I'm sure that's very easy to raise money for as well, because you get to say, oh, look, here we have this poor, poor, you know, person, child, whatever, give us money and and we'll make sure they have a better life. But like you've said, that leaves everybody else behind. And there is a better way to create community and holistic healing and generational healing, Mm -hmm. which I think is so cool in, in what you're doing, because you've really, like I said before, you've really planted here and your roots have just gone out and your, the focus on holistic community is just such a beautiful thing. It's fine. It's important that you you cannot take one member of a family and fix one member of a family. You have yeah. to fix the whole family. And if you take a child from the family, you know, you're either going to create a complete cut between the family and the child, complete, you know, they're completely separated, or that child is constantly going to yearn to go back to family. Yeah. And so they've got this ish, these unresolved issues constantly that – they're going, they, they want their family or they're, they're missing their family. And it, it does create a, a, a big problem. It's, it's far, you know, it's the only way you're going to mend society is to keep families healthy and whole. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, any programs like NAMA or Child Rescue Kenya, where, where I do my stuff and that, that do that, I think, you know, we see successes. Um, we put youth through training. We see a year or two later when you go to visit them that, you know, they're working, their families are happier and healthier than how we found them. Mm. And, and we're done with them then. They're, they're like, you're on your, you're now independent. You don't need us anymore. It's taken no time at all, a year or two or three invested in you and your whole family is better off. Um, whereas if we'd taken you and put you into a children's home, right. Eight, you know, 10 years, 18 years. Plus, 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 right. plus because you know. all of the trauma that comes with and that. And you're going to leave a children's institution and you're going to need help to get on to be independent and stand on your own two feet because you've never done it. And you no longer have a support system. And you system. no longer have a community or a support system. Yeah. That's been cut off from you. You yeah. don't know your community. Um, so, you know, I, you, you really have to think twice about taking a child and putting them into that sort of environment, I yeah. think. Um, it, it can be done better. And nowadays we should be able to do it better. We should be looking more at preventing. Yeah, we should know better. Preventing children ending up on the street, uh, preventing ch- families being split apart. We, sh- we should know better now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There was a time and a place for it and it's no longer. It's long past. Yes. yes. There will always be a child that needs a children's home. Yes. There will always be a need. Um, but I think for, for many years it was just too easy. Mm-hmm. to do that and it was, and now it's total it's not the right approach yeah not right there will always be children i have placed children myself in children's home in the last couple of years yeah that have needed it they're they're in danger at home or there is nobody who will take them on especially children with special needs where there's been you know issues or medical problems that no one you know people are not going to care for them properly mm-hmm. there's always going to be a need but poverty is not a good enough excuse yes 
Absolutely. I love your whole story. Um, So you've been doing this obviously for a long time. What are your dreams for the future? What do you hope to see happen in the future? I'd like to see, like I say, you know, more, more organizations that are focusing on helping people acquire life skills, um, providing more counseling and, and a place for people to go. I mean, if I had money, I would love to set up citizens' advice bureaus in towns where people could just go and get advice mm. um, and information. And if they have a problem, they can just walk through a door and say, look, this is my problem. What can I do? Where do I go? Who can help me? Um, because that's lacking. And I, I've seen the difference that good social workers and good counsellors can make in an organisation, not just to the ch- to children but to adults. Absolutely. And there needs to be more of that here. I'd love to see more of that, that people could walk off the street and get find help, mm. not be struggling in a village or at home and not knowing what to do yeah. and then making bad choices because they don't know what yeah. the alternatives are. I'd love to see more information available more resources available to people here. Um, And then personally, I just want to get my kids through school, through education, to a point in their lives where they can end up doing what they want to do, um, that they can have contented, fulfilled lives, whatever they end up doing, um, and not feel pushed into stuff, Mm. that they know that you have choices in life and you might make a bad choice, But that doesn't define your future. You can come back from that. You can learn from it, make the next make the next choice a good choice. And and hope that they all manage to do that and feel that you can you can do what you want to do, up to you know, within reason. Um, (laughs) but you know, you're in control of your own destiny. Absolutely. Don't be forced into to doing things. And there's just too much of that going Mm. on that kids and youths feel they have to do things a particular way and they don't have a choice right so i i would like to see more that people have more freedom to do what they want to do yeah freedom yeah i think that sums up a lot of that right because so much of what you hope for your community is about the freedom to make Mm. choices Mm. You don't have to follow all the conventions. Yeah. You have to follow the laws and all right. <laughs> the rest of it, but you don't have to follow all the social conventions. Sure. You have a mind of your own. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Make your choice. So because of your experiences, what you have walked through in your life, what does it mean to you to live with compassion? It's a choice people make every day when people ask you for help or you see someone who needs help. Um, like I say, it's, it's hard because... I try, I think of myself as compassionate, but I still do get irritated when people are constantly asking me for stuff. <laughs> and I, but what irritates me is a lot of what they're asking for, they don't really need it. Mm. Um, and I think I get frustrated because people will walk up to me with a kind of, can you help me put my kid through university? And I'm like, but you're a teacher, you're earning a salary, Mm. you have a car. I don't have a car. I sold my car years ago to pay my kids' school fees. Um, You're asking me for something and you earn more than I do. You don't need it. So, you know, I probably come across as this (laughs) cold-hearted, miserable woman. But at the same time, if somebody like my friend Rosemary will send me a photograph of I was in the village and I found this baby today Mm. and I'm like, get the baby to the hospital now and we will figure out how we're going to pay for it later. So yeah, to me, compassion is if you see someone who is in need and it's genuine need, you do something about it. Yeah. No questions asked. Yeah. You, you you do, you do something about it and you worry about the consequences later, but that's compassion. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) Worry about the consequences, the consequences later. later. <laughs> I love it. That's a, that's a tagline right so there. So I always say to my friend, Ro- <laughs> Rosemary is the one who helps with the medical stuff. I'm like, we're not taking on any more new cases, Rosemary. I have no income at the moment. We can't <laughs> afford it. So let's just focus on the ones we're already helping that need to, you know, to go back for another surgery or need to, you know, to replace a wheelchair or whatever it might be. And she's constantly oh, well, there's this child. No, this woman brought a child to me, and I'm like, okay, well, just that one. (laughs) Just one more. Just one. There's always one more, but you know what? That's 
Like you said, that's what compassion is. And that's what compassion is. You go out to, you know, in, during COVID, we went to visit some of the children that we work with but who were off school and we were worried about because a lot of them are in boarding schools or special schools where you know they're getting fed. And when the schools were closed down, it's like, how are things for them at home? Mm -hmm. And we were horrified, even Rosemary, and she's seen more than I have, um, you know, that people were almost starving. And the child who is useless because they're disabled or they they get less than the ones who are able-bodied because it's like, we only have one bowl of maize and Mm -hmm. guess who's going to get fed today? Um, And so, you know, even then we were like, we've got to, we've got to get food to these people. And yeah, I'm not going to worry about, I'm dipping into money that I need to feed my own kids or send them back to school with. Mm. Right now, those kids are going to die. So we'll worry about the consequences later. So it it's hard to live here and not be compassionate. Yeah. Because you, you're going, something's going to hit you in the face every day. Mm. That's going to make you think, How can you turn your back on that or walk away from it? Sure. This community is faced with life and death Mm. in a way that... We're not in the West. Yeah. 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 And and that's the thing. It's it's, every time I go back, I find it harder and harder because Mm. my priorities are so different. Sure. Um, You know, you've got someone who's... Oh, it's the end of the world. My dishwasher is broken. We won't be able to afford one for three months. And, you know, I'm, you're trying not to laugh because it's yeah. like, really? <laughs> yeah. If I had a dishwasher, I'd have sold it by now to send someone to hospital. But, but, you know, you can't get upset with people in the West because we don't see it. I mean, I was no. the same. You don't see it. It's a completely different yeah. life. And you don't have to see it if you don't want to. You just have to turn off the TV. Well, you don't have to see true. it. You can just pretend it doesn't exist. You can't do that here. Mm. You cannot. No, no. cannot do that. You are in constant You're proximity. In constant, yes, yeah. you can't do it. Yeah. So, you know, you, you're just faced with that decision every day. Yeah. Yeah. There's such vibrancy here and such lushness here and in the scenery and the people. And it's, it's such a beautiful place. And so there is a tension there of beauty and suffering Mm. that is constantly held and, and you can't really turn away from either, you know, they're just always in front of you. Mm. And so that's a tension that a lot of people don't have to hold because they, they don't have to be confronted with suffering uh, in their community on a, on a day-to-day basis like yeah. that. Yeah. Like I say, you know, you're in the West, you, you can turn turn it on and turn it off and every now and then send some money to the Red Cross and feel you're, you right. know, you've done something. Check mark. And, yeah, sure. and we've all done it. I've been, I've been sure. there too. You know, we've all, done, we've all done it. But it's, it is much harder to be like that here because yeah. you are faced with it. Well, it, depending on where you live and what kind of lifestyle you have, you know, sure. you're going to be faced with it more often. Sure. If you live in a nice fancy house on the coast or a fancy apartment in the best part of Nairobi, you're not going to see it every day. Mm-hmm. Um, if you live in a town like Kitale, if all you're going to do is go to the supermarket and pack, you're not going to see it. But if once you get to know people and get to know the community and visit people and travel anywhere, you're going to see it. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you're willing to open your eyes, it's everywhere, mm. right? And and like you said at the beginning, when you expose yourself to things, especially through travel, your life just changes. You change as a person. Mm. And you you can't unknow the things that you learn through those experiences. Yes, yeah, I said that to my friend last week when she sent me this photograph of a child that we helped last week, and she sent me the picture, and I said. I can't now unsee that, yeah. can I? <laughs> no. Nope. I can't unsee nope. it. We have to do something <laughs> about this now. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, but it's a special calling, I think, because mm. not everybody can do that. No, not everybody can. And, you know, and it's, it's easy to be judgmental, but you can't be. Not everybody can handle it. Not everybody can do it. Not everybody can deal with it. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, there there are some of us that have to do these things and there are Others that have to do other things. Right. For some people, you know, philanthropy is always going to just be, I'll give you money to do it and you do it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to see it. And it's like, well, that's fine. You're still doing your bit. Right. Right. Um, if, if all you want to do is send some money, that's fine. You know, it's not for everybody. It's, right. it's you know, it's, it's really not for everybody. 
um, being a social worker. I couldn't be a social worker. Right. I know I couldn't do it. I admire social workers tremendously that can do the things and listen to the stories they listen to on a daily basis and counsel people. Mm. I don't have the patience. I couldn't do it. So, yeah, we all have our different thing. Our different yeah. thing we have to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I don't want to take more of your time. You've been so gracious with me already. I just want to thank you so much. You are very welcome. I have loved getting to hear a little bit of your story. Good. And I've loved saying here, it is just beautiful. And I do feel like I've been welcomed into your home. You have been welcomed into our home. <laughs> and we hope you come back again. Oh, I'm planning on it. Yes, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's been fun talking to you. Thank you so much for listening to The Human Experience. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with others, and leave a rating and review on your favorite platform. Everyone has a story, and I'd love to hear yours, so be sure to check out the show notes for more information about how to stay in touch. Do good and take care.